Track 26. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Glenn Hallstrom, a.k.a. Smokestack Jones. Track 26. The Third Epoch. Three. This was the story of the past, the story so far as we knew it then. Two obvious conclusions presented themselves to my mind after hearing it. In the first place I saw darkly what the nature of the conspiracy had been, how chances had been watched, and how circumstances had been handled to ensure impunity to a daring and intricate crime. While all the details were still a mystery to me, the vile manner in which the personal resemblance between the woman in white and Lady Glyde had been turned to account was clear beyond a doubt. It was plain that Anne Catherick had been introduced into Count Fosco's house as Lady Glyde. It was plain that Lady Glyde had taken the dead woman's place in the asylum, the substitution having been managed as to make innocent people, the doctor and the two servants certainly, and the owner of the madhouse in all probability accomplices in the crime. The second conclusion came as the necessary consequence of the first. We three had no mercy to expect from Count Fosco and Sir Percival Glyde. The success of the conspiracy had brought with it a clear gain for those two men of thirty thousand pounds, twenty thousand to one, ten thousand to the other through his wife. They had that interest as well as other interests in ensuring their impunity from exposure and they would leave no stone unturned, no sacrifice unattempted, no treachery untried, to discover the place in which their victim was concealed, and to part her from the only friend she had in the world, Marian Halcombe and myself. The sense of this serious peril, a peril which every day and every hour might bring nearer and nearer to us, was the one influence that guided me in fixing the place of our retreat. I chose it in the far east of London, where there were fewest idle people to lounge and look about them in the streets. I chose it in a poor and populous neighbourhood, because the harder the struggle for existence among the men and women about us, the less the risk of their having time or taking the pains to notice chance strangers who came among them. These were the great advantages I looked to. But a locality was a gain to us also in another and hardly less important respect we could live cheaply by the daily work of my hands, and could save every farthing we possessed to forward the purpose, the righteous purpose, of redressing an infamous wrong, which, from first to last, I now kept steadily in view. In a week's time Marian Halcombe and I had settled how the course of our new lives should be directed. There were no other lodgers in the house, and we had the means of going in and out without passing through the shop. I arranged for the present, at least, that neither Marian nor Laura should stir outside the door without my being with them, and that in my absence from home they should let no one into their rooms on any pretence whatsoever. This rule established, I went to a friend whom I had known in former days, a wood-engraver in large practice, to seek for employment, telling him at the same time that I had reasons for wishing to remain unknown. He at once concluded that I was in debt, and expressed his regret in the usual forms and then promised to do what he could to assist me. I left his false impression undisturbed, and accepted the work he had to give. He knew that he could trust my experience and my industry. I had what he wanted, steadiness and facility, and, though my earnings were but small, they sufficed for our necessities. As soon as we could feel certain of this, Mariam Halcombe and I put together what we possessed. She had between two and three hundred pounds left of her own property, and I had nearly as much remaining from the purchase money obtained by the sale of my drawing-master's practice before I left England. Together we made up between us more than four hundred pounds. I deposited this little fortune in a bank, to be kept for the expense of those secret inquiries and investigations which I was determined to set on foot, and to carry on by myself if I could to find no one to help me. We calculated our weekly expenditure to the last farthing, and we never touched our little fund, except in Laura's interests and for Laura's sake. The housework, which, if we had dared trust a stranger near us, would have been done by a servant, was taken on the first day 
taken as her own right by Marian Halcombe. What a woman's hands are fit for, she said. Early and late these hands of mine shall do. They trembled as she held them out. The wasted arms told their sad story of the past, as she turned up the sleeves of the poor, plain dress that she wore for safety's sake, and the unquenchable spirit of the woman burnt bright in her even yet. I saw the big tears rise thick in her eyes, and fall slowly over her cheeks as she looked at me. She dashed them away with a touch of her old energy, and smiled with a faint reflection of her old good spirits. "'Don't doubt my courage, Walter,' she pleaded. "'It's my weakness that cries, not me. The housework shall conquer it, if I can't.' And she kept her word. The victory was won when we met in the evening, and she sat down to rest. Her large, steady black eyes looked at me with a flash of their bright firmness of bygone days. "'I'm not quite broken down yet,' she said. "'I'm worth trusting with my share of the work.' Before I could answer, she added in a whisper, "'And worth trusting, with my share in the risk and the danger, too. Remember that if the time comes.' I did remember it when the time came. As early as the end of October the daily course of our lives had assumed its settled direction, and we three were as completely isolated in our place of concealment as if the house we lived in had been a desert island, and the great network of streets and the thousands of our fellow creatures all around us the waters of an illimitable sea. I could now reckon on some leisure time for considering what my future plan of action should be, and how I might arm myself most securely at the outset for the coming struggle with Sir Percival and the Count. I gave up all hope of appealing to my recognition of Laura, or to Marian's recognition of her in proof of her identity. If we had loved her less dearly, if the instinct implanted in us by that love had not been far more certain than any exercise of reasoning, far keener than any process of observation, even we might have hesitated on first seeing her. The outward changes wrought by the suffering and the terror of the past had fearfully, almost hopelessly, strengthened the fatal resemblance between Anne Catherick and herself. In my narrative of events at the time of my residence in Limeridge House I have recorded, from my own observation of the two, how the likeness, striking as it was when viewed generally, failed in many important points of similarity when tested in detail. In those former days, if they had both been seen together side by side, no person could for a moment have mistaken them one for the other as has happened often in the instance of twins. I could not say this now. The sorrow and suffering, which I had once blamed myself for associating even by a passing thought with the future of Laura Fairley, had set their profaning marks on the youth and beauty of her face, and the fatal resemblance which I had once seen and shuddered at seeing in idea only was now a real and living resemblance which asserted itself before my own eyes strangers' acquaintances, friends even, who could not look at her as we looked, if she had been shown to them in the first days of her rescue from the asylum, might have doubted if she were the Laura Fairley they had once seen, and doubted without blame. The one remaining chance, which I had at first thought might be trusted to serve us, the chance of appealing to her recollection of persons and events which no impostor could be familiar, was proved by the sad test of our later experience, to be hopeless. Every little caution that Mary and I practised towards her, every little remedy we tried to strengthen and steady slowly the weakened, shaken faculties, was a fresh protest in itself against the risk of turning her mind back on the troubled and terrible past. The only events of the former days which we ventured on encouraging her to recall were the little trivial domestic events of that happy time at Limeridge, when I first went there and taught her to draw. The day when I roused those remembrances by showing her the sketch of the summer-house which she had given me on the morning of our farewell, and which had never been separated from me since, was the birthday of our first hope. Tenderly and gradually the memory of the old walks and drives dawned upon her, and the poor, weary, pining eyes looked at Marian and at me with a new interest, with a faltering thoughtfulness in them which from that moment we cherished and kept alive. 
I bought her a little box of colours and a sketch-book, like the old sketch-book which I had seen in her hands on the morning that we first met. Once again, oh me, once again, at the spare hours saved from my work, in the dull London light, in the poor London room, I sat by her side to guide the faltering touch, to help the feeble hand. Day by day I raised and raised the new interest till its place in the blank of her existence was at last assured, till she could think of her drawing and talk of it, and patiently practice it by herself, with some faint reflection of the innocent pleasure in my encouragement, the growing enjoyment in her own progress, which belonged to the lost life and the lost happiness of past days. We helped her mind, slowly by this simple means. We took her out between us to walk on fine days, in the quiet old city square near at hand, where there was nothing to confuse or alarm her. We spared a few pounds from the fund at the bankers to get her wine, and the delicate strengthening food that she required. We amused her in the evenings with children's games at cards, with scrapbooks full of prints which I borrowed from the engraver, who employed me. By these and other trifling attentions like them, we composed her and steadied her, and hoped all things, as cheerfully as we could from time and care, that love that never neglected and never despaired of her. But to take her mercilessly from seclusion and repose, to confront her with strangers, or with acquaintances who were little better than strangers, to rouse the painful impressions of her past life, which we had so carefully hushed to rest, this, even in her own interests, we dared not do. Whatever sacrifices it cost, whatever long, weary, heart-breaking the delays it involved, the wrong that had been inflicted on her, if mortal means could grapple it, must be redressed without her knowledge and without her help. This resolution settled, it was necessary to decide how the first risk should be ventured, and what the first proceedings should be. After consulting with Marian, I resolved to begin by gathering together as many facts as could be recollected, and then to ask the advice of Mr. Kyle, whom we knew we could trust and to ascertain from him in the first instance if the legal remedy lay fairly within our reach. I owed it to Laura's interests not to stake her whole future on my own unaided exertions, so long as there was the faintest prospect of gaining our position by obtaining reliable assistance of any kind. The first source of information to which I applied was the journal kept at Blackwater Park by Marion Holcomb. There were passages in this diary relating to myself which she thought it best that I should not see. Accordingly, she read to me from the manuscript, and I took the notes I wanted as she went on. We could only find time to pursue this occupation by sitting up late at night. Three nights were devoted to the purpose, and were enough to put me in possession of all that Marian could tell. My next proceeding was to gain as much additional evidence as I could procure from other people without exciting suspicion. I went myself to Mrs. Vasey to ascertain if Laura's impression of having slept there was correct or not. In this case, from consideration for Mrs. Vasey's age and infirmity, and in all subsequent cases of the same kind from considerations of caution, I kept our real position a secret, and was always careful to speak of Laura as the late Lady Glyde. Mrs. Vasey's answer to my inquiries only confirmed the apprehensions which I previously felt. Laura had certainly written to say she would pass the night under the roof of her old friend, but she had never been near the house. Her mind in this instance, and, as I feared, in other instances beside, confusedly presented to her something which she had only intended to do in the false light of something which she had really done. The unconscious contradiction of herself was easy to account for in this way, but it was likely to lead to serious results. It was a stumble on the threshold at starting. It was a flaw in the evidence which told fatally against us. When I next asked for the letter which Laura had written to Mrs. Vasey from Blackwater Park, it was given to me without the envelope, which had been thrown into the waste-paper basket and long since destroyed. In the letter itself no date was mentioned, not even the day of the week. It only contained these lines. Dearest Mrs. Vasey, I am in sad distress and anxiety and I may come to your house to-morrow night and ask for a bed. I can't tell you what is the matter in this letter. I write it in such fear of being found out, 
that I can fix my mind on nothing. Pray be at home to see me. I will give you a thousand kisses, and tell you everything. Your affectionate Laura. What help was there in those lines? None. On returning from Mrs. Vase's I instructed Marian to write, observing the same caution which I practised myself to Mrs. Mitchelson. She was to express, if she pleased, some general suspicion of Count Fosco's conduct, and she was to ask the housekeeper to supply us with a plain statement of events in the interests of truth. While we were waiting for the answer, which reached us in a week's time, I went to the doctor in St. John's Wood, introduced myself as sent by Miss Halcombe to collect, if possible, more particulars of her sister's last illness than Mr. Kyle had found the time to procure. By Mr. Goodrick's assistance I obtained a copy of the certificate of death, and an interview with the woman, Jane Gould, who had been employed to prepare the body for the grave. Through this person I also discovered a means of communicating with the servant, Hester Pinhorn. She had recently left her place in consequence of a disagreement with her mistress, and she was lodging with some people in the neighbourhood whom Mrs. Gould knew. In the manner here indicated I obtained the narratives of the housekeeper, of the doctor, of Jane Gould, and of Hester Pinhorn exactly as they are presented in these pages. Furnished with such additional evidence as these documents afforded, I considered myself to be sufficiently prepared for a consultation with Mr. Kyle, and Marian wrote accordingly to mention my name to him, and to specify the day and hour at which I requested to see him on private business. There was time enough in the morning for me to take Laura out for her walk as usual, and to see her quietly settled at her drawing afterwards. She looked up at me with a new anxiety in her face as I rose to leave the room, and her fingers began to toy doubtfully in the old way, with the brushes and pencils on the table. "'You are not tired of me yet,' she said. "'You are not going away because you are tired of me. I will try to do better. I will try to get well. Are you as fond of me, Walter, as you used to be, now I am so pale and thin and so slow in learning to draw?' She spoke as a child might have spoken showed me her thoughts as a child might have shown me them. I waited a few minutes longer, waited to tell her that she was dearer to me now than she had ever been in past times. Try to get well again, I said, encouraging the new hope in the future which I saw dawning in her mind. Try to get well again, for Marian's sake and for mine. Yes, she said to herself, returning to her drawing, I must try, because they are both so fond of me. She suddenly looked up again. "'Don't be gone long. I can't get on with my drawing, Walter, when you're not here to help me. I shall be back soon, my darling. Soon be back to see how you're getting on.' My voice faltered a little in spite of me. I forced myself from the room. It was no time then for parting with the self-control which might yet serve me in my need before the day was out. As I opened the door I beckoned to Marian to follow me to the stairs was necessary to prepare her for a result which I felt might sooner or later follow my showing myself openly in the streets. "'I shall in all probability be back in a few hours,' I said. "'And you will take care as usual to let no one inside the doors in my absence. But if anything happens, what can happen?' she interposed quickly. "'Tell me plainly, Walter, if there's any danger I shall know how to meet it.' "'The only danger,' I replied is that Sir Percival Glyde may have been recalled to London by the news of Laura's escape. You are aware that he had me watched before I left England, and that he probably knows me by sight, although I don't know him." She laid her hand on my shoulder, and looked at me in anxious silence. I saw she understood the serious risk that threatened us. "'It's not likely,' I said, that I shall be seen in London again so soon, either by Sir Percival himself, or by the persons in his employ but it is barely possible that an accident may happen. In that case you will not be alarmed if I fail to return to-night, and you will satisfy any inquiry of Laura's with the best excuse you can make for me. If I find the least reason to suspect that I am watched, I will take good care that no spy follows me back to this house. Don't doubt my return, Marian, however it may be delayed, and fear nothing." Nothing, she answered firmly. You shall not regret, Walter, that you have only a woman to help you." She paused and detained me a moment longer. "'Take care,' she said. 
pressing my hand anxiously. Take care. I left her and set forth to pave the way for discovery, the dark and doubtful way, which began at the lawyer's door. 4. No circumstances of the slightest importance happened on my way to the offices of Messrs. Gilmore and Kyle in Chancery Lane. While my car was being taken in to Mr. Kyle, a consideration occurred to me which I deeply regretted not having thought of before. The information derived from Marian's diary made it a matter of certainty that Count Fosco had opened her first letter from Blackwater Park to Mr. Kyle, and had, by means of his wife, intercepted the second. He was therefore well aware of the address of the office, and he would naturally infer that if Marian wanted advice and assistance, after Laura's escape from the asylum, she would apply once more to the experience of Mr. Kyle. In this case, the office in Chancery Lane was the very first place which he and Sir Percival would cause to be watched, and if the same persons were chosen for the purpose who had been employed to follow me before my departure from England, the fact of my return would in all probability be ascertained on that very day. I had thought generally of the chances of being recognized in the streets, but the special risk connected with the office had never occurred to me until the present moment. It was too late now to repair this unfortunate error in judgment, too late to wish that I had made arrangements for meeting the lawyer in some place privately appointed beforehand. I could only resolve to be cautious on leaving Chancery Lane and not to go straight home again under any circumstances whatever. After waiting a few minutes, I was shown into Mr. Kyle's private room. He was a pale, thin, quiet, self-possessed man, with a very attentive eye, a very low voice, and a very undemonstrative manner. Not, as I judged, ready with his sympathy where strangers were concerned, and not at all easy to disturb in his professional composure. A better man for my purpose could hardly have been found. If he committed himself to a decision at all, and if the decision was favourable, the strength of our case was as good as proved from that moment. "'Before I enter on the business which brings me here,' I said, "'I ought to warn you, Mr. Kyle, that the shortest statement I can make of it will occupy some little time. "'My time is at Miss Halcombe's disposal,' he replied. Where any interests of hers are concerned, I represent my partner personally as well as professionally. It was at his request that I should do so, when he ceased to take an active part in business. May I inquire whether Mr. Kilmore is in England? He is not. He is living with his relatives in Germany. His health has improved, but the period of his return is still uncertain. While we were exchanging these few preliminary words, he had been searching among papers before him, and he now produced from them a sealed letter. I thought he was about to hand the letter to me, but apparently changing his mind, he placed it by itself on the table, settled himself in his chair, and silently waited to hear what I had to say. Without wasting a moment in preparatory words of any sort, I entered on my narrative, and put him in full possession of the events which had already been related in these pages. Lawyer as he was to the very marrow of his bones, I startled him out of his professional composure. Expressions of incredulity and surprise, which he could not repress, interrupted me several times before I had done. I persevered, however, to the end, and as soon as I reached it, boldly asked the one important question. What is your opinion, Mr. Kyle? He was too cautious to commit himself to an answer, without taking time to recover his self-possession first. Before I give you my opinion, he said, I must beg permission to clear the ground by a few questions. He put the questions, sharp, suspicious, unbelieving questions, which clearly showed me as they proceeded that he thought I was the victim of a delusion, and that he might even have doubted, but for my introduction to him by Miss Halcombe, whether I was not attempting the perpetration of a cunningly designed fraud. "'Do you believe that I have spoken the truth, Mr. Kyle?' I asked, when he had done examining me. "'So far as your own convictions are concerned, I am certain you have spoken the truth,' he replied. "'I have the highest esteem for Miss Halcombe, and I have therefore every reason to respect a gentleman whose mediation she trusts in a matter of this kind. I will even go further, if you like, and admit, for courtesy's sake and for argument's sake, 
that the identity of Lady Glyde as a living person is a proved fact to Miss Halcombe and yourself. But you come to me for a legal opinion. As a lawyer, and as a lawyer only, it is my duty to tell you, Mr. Hartwright, that you have not a shadow of a case. You put it strongly, Mr. Kyle. I will try to put it plainly as well. The evidence of Lady Glyde's death is, on the face of it, clear and satisfactory. There is her aunt's testimony to prove that she came to Count Fosco's house, that she fell ill and that she died. There is the testimony of the medical certificate to prove the death, and to show that it took place under natural circumstances. There is the fact of the funeral at Limbridge, and there is the assertion of the inscription on the tomb. That is the case you want to overthrow. What evidence have you to support the declaration on your side that the person who died and was buried was not Lady Glyde? Let us run through the main points of your statement and see what they are worth. Miss Halcombe goes to a certain private asylum, and there seeks a certain female patient. It is known that a woman named Anne Catherick, and bearing an extraordinary personal resemblance to Lady Glyde, escaped from the asylum. It is known that a person received there last July was received as Anne Catherick, brought back. It is known that the gentleman who brought her back warned Mr. Fairley that it was part of her insanity to be bent on impersonating his dead niece, and it is known that she did repeatedly declare herself in the asylum, where no one believed her, to be Lady Glyde. These are all facts. What have you to set against them? Miss Halcombe's recognition of the woman which recognition, after events, invalidate or contradict. Does Miss Halcombe assert her supposed sister's identity to the owner of the asylum, and take legal means for rescuing her? No, she secretly bribes a nurse to let her escape. When the patient has been released in this doubtful manner, and is taken to Mr. Fairley, does he recognise her? Is he staggered for one instant in his belief of his niece's death? No. Do the servants recognise her? No. Is she kept in the neighbourhood to assert her own identity, and to stand the test of further proceedings? No. She is privately taken to London. In the meantime you have recognised her also, but you are not a relative. You are not even an old friend of the family. The servants contradict you, and Mr. Fairley contradicts Miss Halcombe, and the supposed Lady Glyde contradicts herself. She declares she passed the night in London at a certain house. Your own evidence shows that she has never been near that house, and your own admission is that her condition of mind prevents you from producing her anywhere, to submit to investigation, and to speak for herself. I pass over minor points of evidence on both sides to save time, and I ask you, if this case were to go now to a court of law, to go before a jury, bound to take facts as they reasonably appear, where are your proofs? I was obliged to wait and collect myself before I could answer him. It was the first time the story of Laura and the story of Marian had been presented to me from a stranger's point of view, the first time the terrible obstacles that lay across our path had been made to show themselves in their true character. There can be no doubt, I said, that the facts as you have stated them appear to tell against us, but—but but you think those facts can be explained away, interposed Mr. Kyle. Let me tell you the result of my experience on that point. When an English jury has to choose between a plain fact on the surface and a long explanation under the surface, it always takes the fact in preference to the explanation. For example, Lady Glyde, I shall call the lady you represent by that name for argument's sake, declares she has slept at a certain house, and it is proved that she has not slept at that house. You explain this circumstance by entering into the state of her mind, and deducing from it a metaphysical condition. I won't say the conclusion is wrong. I only say that the jury will take the fact of her contradicting herself in preference to any reason for the contradiction that you can offer. But is it not possible, I urged, by dint of patience and exertion, to discover additional evidence? Miss Halcombe and I have a few hundred pounds. He looked at me with half-suppressed pity, and shook his head. "'Consider the subject, Mr. Hartwright, from your own point of view,' he said. "'If you are right about Sir Percival Glyde and Count Fosco, 
which I don't admit, mind, every imaginable difficulty would be thrown in the way of your getting fresh evidence. Every obstacle of litigation would be raised. Every point in the case would be systematically contended. And by the time we had spent our thousands instead of our hundreds, the final result would in all probability be against us. Questions of identity, where instances of personal resemblance are concerned, are in themselves the hardest of all questions to settle. The hardest, even when they are free from complications which beset the case we are now discussing. I really see no prospect of throwing any light whatever on this extraordinary affair. Even if the person buried in Limeridge churchyard were not Lady Glyde, she was in life, on your own showing, so like her, that we should gain nothing if we applied for the necessary authority to have the body exhumed. In short, there is no case, Mr. Hartwright, there really is no case. I was determined to believe that there was a case, and in that determination shifted my ground and appealed to him once more. Are there not other proofs that we might produce besides the proof of identity? I asked. Not as you are situated, he replied. The simplest and surest of all proofs, the proof of comparison of dates, is, as I understand, altogether out of your reach. If you could show a discrepancy between the date of the doctor's certificate and the date of Lady Glyde's journey to London, the matter would wear a totally different aspect, and I should be the first to say, let us go on. That date may be recovered yet, Mr. Kyle. On the day when it is recovered, Mr. Hartwright, you will have a case. If you have any prospect at this moment of getting at it, tell me, and we shall see if I can advise you." I considered. The housekeeper could not help us. Laura could not help us. Marian could not help us. In all probability the only person in existence who knew the date were Sir Percival and the Count. I can think of no means of ascertaining the date at present, I said, because I can think of no persons who are sure to know it but Count Fosco and Sir Percival Glyde. Mr. Kyle's calmly attentive face relaxed for the first time into a smile. With your opinion of the conduct of those two gentlemen, he said, you don't expect help in that quarter, I presume. If they have combined to gain large sums of money by a conspiracy, they are not likely to confess it at any rate. They may be forced to confess it, Mr. Kyle. By whom? By me. We both rose. He looked me attentively in the face, with more appearance of interest than he had shown yet. I could see that I had perplexed him a little. You are very determined, he said. You have no doubt a personal motive for proceeding, into which it is not my business to inquire. If a case can be produced in the future, I can only say, my best assistance is at your service. At the same time I must warn you, as the money question always enters into the law question, that I see little hope, even if you ultimately establish the fact of Lady Glyde's being alive, of recovering her fortune. The foreigner would probably leave the country before proceedings were commenced, and Sir Percival's embarrassments are numerous enough and pressing enough to transfer almost any sum he may possess from himself to his creditors. You are, of course, aware I stopped him at that point. Let me beg that we not discuss Lady Glyde's affairs, I said. I have never known anything about them in former times, and I know nothing of them now, except that her fortune is lost. You are right in assuming that I have personal motives for stirring in this matter. I wish those motives to be always as disinterested as they are at the present moment. He tried to interpose and explain. I was a little heated, I suppose, by feeling that he had doubted me, and I went on bluntly without waiting to hear him. There shall be no money motive, I said, and no idea of personal advantage in the service I mean to render to Lady Glyde. She has been cast out as a stranger from the house in which she was born. A lie which records her death has been written on her mother's tomb, and there are two men, alive and unpunished, who are responsible for it. That house shall open again to receive her in the presence of every soul who followed the false funeral to the grave. That lie shall be publicly erased from the tombstone by the authority of the head of the family, and those two men shall answer for their crime to me. Though the justice that sits in tribunals is powerless to pursue them, I have given my life to that purpose, and alone as I stand, if God spares me, I will accomplish it." He drew back towards his table, and said nothing. His face showed plainly 
that he thought my delusion had got the better of my reason, and that he considered it totally useless to give me any more advice. We each keep our opinion, Mr. Kyle, I said, and we must await till the events of the future decide between us. In the meantime, I am much obliged to you for the attention you have given to my statement. You have shown me that the legal remedy lies in every sense of the word beyond our means. We cannot produce the law proof, and we are not rich enough to pay the law expenses. It is something gained to know that. I bowed, and walked to the door. He called me back, and gave me the letter which I had seen him place on the table by itself at the beginning of our interview. This came by post a few days ago, he said. Perhaps you will not mind delivering it? Pray tell Miss Halcombe at the same time that I sincerely regret being thus far unable to help her except by advice, which will not be more welcome, I am afraid, to her than to you. I looked at the letter while he was speaking. It was addressed to Miss Halcombe, care of Messrs. Gilmore and Kyle, Chancery Lane. The handwriting was quite unknown to me. On leaving the room I asked one last question. Do you happen to know, I said, if Sir Percival Glyde is still in Paris? He has returned to London, replied Mr. Kyle. At least I heard so from his solicitor whom I met yesterday. After that answer I went out. On leaving the office the first precaution to be observed was to abstain from attracting attention by stopping to look about me. I walked towards one of the quietest of the large squares on the north of Holborn, then suddenly stopped and turned round at the place where a long stretch of pavement was left behind me. There were two men at the corner of the square who had stopped also, and were standing talking together. After a moment's reflection I turned back so as to pass them. One moved as I came near, and turned the corner leading from the square into the street. The other remained stationary. I looked at him as I passed, and instantly recognized him as one of the men who had watched me before I left England. If I had been free to follow my own instincts, I should probably have begun by speaking to the man, and have ended by knocking him down. But I was bound to consider consequences. If I once placed myself publicly in the wrong, I put the weapons at once into Sir Percival's hands. There was no choice but to oppose cunning by cunning. I turned into the street down which the second man had disappeared, and passed him waiting in a doorway. He was a stranger to me, and I was glad to make sure of his personal appearance in case of future annoyance. Having done this, I again walked northward until I reached the new road. There I turned aside to the west, having the men behind me all the time. I waited at a point where I knew myself to be at some distance from a cab-stand, until a fast two-wheeled cab, empty, should happen to pass me. One passed in a few minutes. I jumped in, and told the man to drive rapidly towards Hyde Park. There was no second fast cab for the spies behind me. I saw them dart across to the other side of the street, to follow me by running, until a cab or cab-stand came in their way. But I had the start of them, and when I stopped the driver and got out, they were nowhere in sight. I crossed Hyde Park, and made sure, on the open ground, that I was free. Then, at last, I turned my steps homeward. It was not until many hours later, not until after dark. I found Marian waiting for me alone in the little sitting-room. She had persuaded Laura to go to rest, after first promising to show me her drawing the moment I came in. The poor, little, dim, faint sketch, so trifling in itself, so touching in its associations, was propped up carefully on the table with two books and was placed where the faint light of the one candle we allowed ourselves might fall on it to best advantage. I sat down to look at the drawing, and to tell Marian in whispers what had happened. The partition which divided us from the next room was so thin that we could almost hear Laura's breathing, and we might have disturbed her if we had spoken aloud. Marian preserved her composure while I described my interview with Mr. Kyle but her face became troubled when I spoke next of the men who had followed me from the lawyer's office, and when I told her of the discovery of Sir Percival's return. "'Bad news, Walter,' she said. "'The worst news you could bring. Have you nothing more to tell me?' "'I have something to give you,' I replied, handing her the note which Mr. Kyle had confided to my care. She looked at the address and recognized the handwriting instantly. "'You know your correspondent?' I said. "'Too well,' she answered. My correspondent is Count Fosco. 
With that reply she opened the note. Her face flushed deeply while she read it, her eyes brightened with anger as she handed it to me to read in my turn. The note contained these lines. Impelled by honourable admiration, honourable to myself, honourable to you, I write magnificent Marian in the interest of your tranquillity. I say two consoling words. Fear nothing. Exercise your fine natural sense and remain in retirement. Dear and admirable woman, invite no dangerous publicity. Resignation is sublime. Adopt it. The modest response of home is eternally fresh. Enjoy it. The storms of life pass harmless over the valley of seclusion. Dwell, dear lady, in the valley. Do this, and I authorize you to fear nothing. No new calamities shall lacerate your sensibilities. Sensibility is precious to me as my own. You shall not be molested. The fair companion of your retreat shall not be pursued. She has found new asylum in your heart. Priceless asylum. I envy her and leave her there. One last word of affectionate warning, of paternal caution, and I tear myself from the charm of addressing you. I close these fervent lines. Advance no farther than you have gone already. Compromise no serious interests. Threaten nobody. Do not, I implore you, force me into action. Me, the man of action, when it is the cherished object of my ambition to be passive, to restrict the vast reach of my energy and my combinations for your sake. If you have rash friends, moderate their deplorable ardor. If Mr. Hartwright returns to England, hold no communication with him. I walk on a path of my own, and Percival follows at my heels. On the day when Mr. Hartwright crosses that path, he is a lost man. The only signature to these lines was the initial letter F, surrounded by a circle of intricate flourishes. I threw the letter on the table, with all the contempt that I felt for it. He's trying to frighten you. A sure sign that he's frightened himself, I said. She was too genuine a woman to treat the letter as I had treated it. The insolent familiarity of the language was too much for her self-control. As she looked at me across the table, her hands clenched themselves in her lap, and the old, quick, fiery temper flamed out again brightly in her cheeks and in her eyes. "'Walter,' she said, "'if ever those two men are at your mercy, and if you are obliged to spare one of them, don't let it be the Count.' "'I will keep this letter, Marian, to help my memory when the time comes.' She looked at me attentively, as I put the letter away in my pocket-book. "'When the time comes,' she repeated, "'can you speak of the future as if you were certain of it?' Certain after what you've heard in Mr. Kyle's office, after what has happened to you today? I don't count the time from today, Marian. All I have done today is to ask another man to act for me. I count from tomorrow. Why from tomorrow? Because tomorrow I mean to act for myself. How? I shall go to Blackwater by the first train, and return, I hope, at night. To Blackwater? Yes. I've had time to think since I left Mr. Kyle. His opinion on one point confirms my own. We must persist to the last in hunting down the date of Laura's journey, the one weak point in the conspiracy, and probably the one chance of proving that she is a living woman, centre in the discovery of that date. You mean, said Marian, the discovery that Laura did not leave Blackwater Park until after the date of her death on the doctor's certificate? Certainly. What makes you think that it might have been after? Laura can tell us nothing of the time she was in London. But the owner of the asylum told you that she was received there on the 27th of July. I doubt Count Fosco's ability to keep her in London, and to keep her insensible to all that was passing around her more than one night. In that case, she must have started on the 26th, and must have come to London one day after the date of her own death on the doctor's certificate. If we can prove that date, we prove our case against Sir Percival and the Count. Yes, yes, I see. But how is the proof to be obtained? Mrs. Mitchelson's narrative has suggested to me two ways of trying to obtain it. One of them is to question the doctor, Mr. Dawson, who must know when he resumed his attendance at Blackwater Park after Laura left the house. The other is to make inquiries at the inn to which Sir Percival drove away by himself at night, 
we know that his departure followed Laura's after a lapse of a few hours, and we may get at the date that way. The attempt is at least worth making, and tomorrow I'm determined it shall be made. And suppose it fails. I look at the worst now, Walter, but I will look at the best if disappointments come to try us. Suppose no one can help you at Blackwater. There are two men who can help me, and shall help me in London. Sir Percival and the Count. Innocent people may well forget the date, but they are guilty, and they know it. If I fail everywhere else, I mean to force a confession out of one or both of them on my own terms. All the woman flushed up in Marian's face as I spoke. Begin with the Count, she whispered eagerly. For my sake, begin with the Count. We must begin, for Laura's sake. Where there is the best chance of success, I replied. The colour faded from her face again, and she shook her head sadly. Yes, she said. You're right. It was mean and miserable of me to say that. I try to be patient, Walter, and succeed better now than I did in happier times. But I have a little of my old temper still left, and it will get the better of me when I think of the Count. His turn will come, I said. But remember, there is no weak place in his life that we know of yet. I waited a little to let her recover her self-possession, and then spoke the decisive words. Marian, there is a weak place we both know of in Sir Percival's life. You mean the secret? Yes, the secret. It's our only sure hold on him. I can force him from his position of security. I can drag him and his villainy into the face of day by no other means. Whatever the Count may have done, Sir Percival has consented to the conspiracy against Laura from another motive besides the motive of gain. You heard him tell the Count that he believed his wife knew enough to ruin him. You heard him say that he was a lost man if the secret of Anne Catherick was known. Yes, yes, I did. Well, Marian, when our other resources have failed us, I mean to know the secret. My old superstition clings to me even yet. I say again, the woman in white is a living influence in our three lives. The end is appointed, the end is drawing us on, and Anne Catherick, dead in her grave, points the way to it still. End of track 26